think uh, we have a pleasure to invite the session coordinator, Dr. Mani Singhal, who is a senior consultant, Department of Medical Oncology, Apollo Hospital at New Delhi and Noida. So uh, you have another three minutes, sir. Dr. Uh, Dr. Singhal, all over to you uh, to start the session, please. Yeah. So uh, at the outset, uh, welcome all. And uh, we know that this is the lymphoma month. And uh, it is on 15th of September that the world celebrates the Lymphoma Awareness uh, Day. And this has been an initiative of the Lymphoma Coalition Group, which was perhaps established way back in 2002. And one of their major initiatives, it's, and it's a multi-country um, multi uh, group, almost more than 44 countries are involved in this, uh, in, by, by this group. And it was established by lymphoma survivors, actually. As a matter of fact, one of their most important initiative was Know Your Nodes initiative. And that was a part of the lymphoma awareness program that they initiated. And on that account, I think uh, lymphoma has seen a lot of new developments. And that is the reason that we all need to be updated about uh, the various uh, updates that we keep receiving on lymphoma. As a matter of fact, it has become a totally separate subject altogether now. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll start the, the scientific sessions today. And we have almost about seven or eight presentations. And the first presentation will be made by uh, Dr. Manju Sanger. Uh, she is a professor of medical oncology and looks after hematolymphoid uh, malignancies at Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And with that, over to you, ma'am. And she'll be speaking on uh, chronic, chronic, myeloid, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and what are the new developments uh, in CLN. Uh, thank you, Manish. Uh, can I say, share my slides? Yeah, absolutely, ma'am. Can you see it? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, can we start now? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Manish. Thank you, Gemma, and all the organizers for uh, all, you know, bringing this during the month of uh, what we call as Blood Cancer Awareness Month and with 15 September being Lymphoma Awareness Day. What I'm going to talk over next 10 minutes or so is uh, using molecular and cytogenetic information to sequence treatment in CLL in 2020. We all know that we, you know, there is an expansion in the therapeutic armamentarium in CLL as far as you know, this last decade is concerned with several novel options getting uh, added into the uh, therapeutic armamentarium. Parallelly, there has been a validation of prognostic markers in CLL. And we all know that 17P deletion along with P53 mutation forms the worst subset followed by the 17P deleted subset and then the trisomy 12, 11Q and 13Q and normal cytogenetics are you know, much better as compared to this. Not only just the cytogenetic parameters, even the IGHV uh, mutations, you know, if you see the IGHV mutational status, those who have mutated IGHV, they do much better as compared to those who do not have IGHV mutation status. And this has been validated again in several studies uh, across you know, uh, last decade. So we need to take into account that we have several options. And on top of that, there are groups which don't behave similarly. They are you know, different prognostically. Another important factor which is taken into account in the CLL management is the host. How fit the host is, whether we can go all out and give you know, all possible combination therapy, whether there are any comorbidities or not. So all these factors decide what should be the treatment in uh, chronic lymphoblo lymphocytic leukemia. So let's see this particular scenario. If you have a fit host with non-17P deleted CLL with IGVH mutated, what options we have? So the options what we have here is, you know, the FCR regimen, and there is a data now from both CLL8 trial and the FCR 300 study from uh, MD Anderson that those who have IGHP mutated, non-17P deleted 
fit individuals after FCR, you can see a plateau in their uh, progression free survival, meaning uh, a practical functional cure in these individuals. Can we improve upon that with the novel agent addition? And this is the trial which compared ibrutinib with rituximab in combination with rituximab as opposed to FCR in this particular subset. And the answer is that if you have an IGVH mutated situation, then in that case, FCR and ibrutinib are almost similar. The advantage is that it comes with the defined duration of therapy as opposed to ibrutinib, which needs to be continued. However, for the unmutated setup, the combination of ibrutinib rituximab does better as compared to FCR. Can we combine all three and make things better? So ibrutinib has been combined with FCG, that's obinutuzumab. And you can see this is an early data presented in ASH 2019, and you can see flat curves as far as PFS and OS is concerned. But yes, it does come with toxicity of neutropenia, much more than what you see otherwise with FC. But at the same time, you can limit the duration of ibrutinib therapy and get remarkably better, and many of them being MRD negative CRs in these patients. So you have options for those who have mutated. FCR probably remains the treatment of choice. Those who have unmutated, you have these options of either you know, changing over to ibrutinib or continuing with IFCG. Let's look at a little different scenario if you have either unfit person or 17P deletion or unmutated IGVH, what all options we have. And this is the data from the Resonate 2 trial. And you can clearly see that single agent ibrutinib is associated with five-year progression-free survival of around 70%. So clearly an option. And whether you have mutated or unmutated IGVH or you are 17P deleted, this, these results are much better than you know, uh, any of the other therapies in this particular situation. We have an option of bendamustin rituximab. We know from the CLL10 trial that BR can be a regimen in those who are more than 65 years. How does it fare as compared to ibrutinib? This is the Alliance study which addressed that question. So if you have a 17P non-deleted subset, no deletion 11Q, probably all three of them do as well. If you have a mutated IGVH, probably BR is as good as ibrutinib. But if you have an unmutated IGVH, BR does poorly. So somebody who's unfit does not have a 17P uh, deletion, but has mutated IGVH, BR still remains an option. However, ibrutinib can be considered for those who have unmutated IGHB or 17P deletion or 11Q abnormality. Uh, subsequently, CLL uh, 10, 11 trial addressed whether there is, you know, obnitizumab can be combined with chlorambucil, and that became our standard of care because the PFS was much better as compared to chlorambucil being combined with rituximab. And that became practically the standard of care in somebody who's unfit and cannot tolerate the combination chemoimmunotherapy. And this was the standard of care which was compared against obnitizumab and venetoclax. And you can clearly see that venetoclax obnitizumab combination does much better as compared to chlorambucil and obnitizumab. And if you have, whether you have IGBH mutated, unmutated, it doesn't make a difference if you're combining when with uh, obnitizumab. And same if you, for the P53 status, there is, you know, the outcomes are much better as compared to the control arm. So if you have 17P deleted, if you have somebody who's, you know, not fit for combination chemoimmunotherapy, if you have uh, uh, somebody who has IGVH unmutated, when plus G becomes an option. With the newer BTK inhibitors, that's acalabrutinib, uh, if you combine with obnitizumab and, you know, as, and compare it with obnitizumab and chlorambucil, is it going to be any better? And answer is again, yes, that acalabrutinib with uh, obnitizumab does much better as compared to the comparator arm. However, what is important is we are not very sure how much is actually the difference contributed by obnitizumab here, though there is, you know, statistical significance, but the confidence intervals are very wide. So acalabrutinib as a single agent or in combination with obnitizumab can be considered for people who have 17P deletion. So for the frontline therapy, depending on what molecular abnormality and how the fitness is, you have several options. As we said, if you have fit mutated, CR becomes an option with non-17P. If you have the same you know, uh, genetic abnormality, but in an elderly individual, BR, or somebody who where you think of slow-go approach, uh, uh, obnitizumab with chlorambucil is an option. If you have 17P deletion with unmutated IGBH with multiple comorbidities, you have ibrutinib there, you have VEN plus obnitizumab, you have ibrutinib plus obnitizumab, a as single agent or in combination. 
Similarly, for 11Q also, the uh, conventional chemotherapy, chemoimmunotherapy doesn't do that well. And the similar option, what you're seeing in the unmutated or 17P group can be used in these patients too. Moving on to the last part, that's the relapsed CLL. So uh, we know that ibrutinib came in picture from the relapsed CLL and it was compared with ofatimumab in the Resonate trial. And you can clearly see that those patients who had received chemotherapy earlier and had failed, ibrutinib is one treatment option. So if you are giving chemoimmunotherapy, if a person fails, ibrutinib is, is an option. And same way, if somebody has, you know, has received treatment earlier, whether you know, it's chemoimmunotherapy up to three lines of therapy, a calibrutinib is better as compared to you know, re-challenging them with chemotherapy or re-challenging them with PI3K inhibitor and rituximab. So this is a difference which you see in the progression-free survival. Venetoclax plus rituximab, again, the Murano trial confirmed that it is advantageous as compared to the chemoimmunotherapy combination by resulting in better progression-free survival in this subgroup. What about the PI3K inhibitors? The adlanilisib in the frontline setting did not, you know, was not very well tolerated, and but in the relapse setting, it did show that there was improvement in PFS. So again, several multiple options in the relapse setting. Uh, if the person has been treated with the, uh, the conventional chemoimmunotherapy, and to a certain extent, even with the novel agents. So there is a newer PI3K, PI3K inhibitor, Devalisib has come, which is again effective in the relapsed refractory setting. What about sequencing? How do we sequence in the relapse setting? So suppose if somebody has received chemoimmunotherapy earlier, this real-world data suggests that using ibrutinib there is probably going to be a much better choice rather than idelalisib. If you're using a treatment discontinuation, because more and more recent trials are focusing on fixed duration therapy with novel agents because of achievement of better MRD and you can discontinue therapy. And in that scenario, venetoclax is, is associated with bet better survival. If you have ibrutinib failure, what does well? The data suggests that venetoclax is probably the best choice there if you have you know, ibrutinib failure. So these are the sequence uh, things which we need to keep in mind when we are deciding the therapy for uh, uh, relapse CLL, depending on what treatment they have received earlier and how long back they have received. No talk can be completed in lymphomas or uh, leukemias nowadays without CAR T cell therapy and CLL is no exception. So uh, CAR T cell therapy again has a role in uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia who have failed ibrutinib and even for that matter venetoclax. So something to look forward to. So uh, to just summarize, what are the options once you have relapsed CLL? You can repeat the same treatment if the PFS has been three years or more. You can consider chemoimmunotherapy in this setting if the prior treatment was chemoimmunotherapy with no 17P deletion at the time of relapse. If you have used ibrutinib in frontline setting, venetoclax is one option, followed by idelalazib. If you have multiple agent failure and you, know, so, and you have access to CAR T cell therapy, that's one, one of the option. Patients who are young, fit, 17P deleted and have failed novel agents, allogenic stem cell transplant, if you have an HLA match sibling or HLA match donor, that can be one option. So with that, I would end. I think uh, my 10 minutes are over. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And I think it's a very crisp and very exhaustively you have covered everything. So thank you very much. And with this, I'll, we'll go on to uh, uh, the next speaker. And our next speaker is Dr. Anil Handu. Dr. Anil Handu is MD Pathology and he's a Senior Consultant Hematology and Director Laboratory Services at BLK uh, Super Specialty Hospital in New, uh, New Delhi. He's also a very senior member of NABL Accreditation Board. Dr. Handu. Uh, uh, thank you. At the outset, I'd like to thank you and the rest of the group who've given me this opportunity to be presenting something on understanding your lymphoma diagnosis. I must admit that uh, it will be a marathon because practically speaking, within 10 minutes to actually cover up the entire lymphoma diagnostics is practically impossible. But what I'll be trying to do is giving you a very small and uh, a brief insight about how diagnostics are shaping up with respect to lymphoma today. So uh, this is what we all are worried about. The moment we have these lumps and bumps across the body, the most important answer that we need to first give is, is it lymphoma or otherwise? And obviously, how do we want to get there and what subtype, et cetera, we are wanting to be interested in. And therefore, all that becomes extremely important for us to look at once we are getting these kind of cases. So what I have done is I have actually just put in a few cases to start with, and they're just pictures. I'm sure a lot of you may have seen them 
during your uh, post graduation and super post graduation and uh, i am also sure that you know you would agree to what i am going to be talking about we'll talk a little bit about morphology some ancillary techniques i'll give you a little bit of an insight about fna and non hodgkins lymphoma flow which happens to be something that i am in love with that will also be there a little bit here and there of course a bit of hodgkins and then genomics precision medicine and expected report contents of non hodgkins and hodgkins lymphoma and if we get some more time uh, by that time we will give some conclusions as well all right so this is a picture which is i'm sure if uh, you know the pathologists are there on board they would have seen this kind of a picture many many times during their post graduation and they would have noticed that you know when you have this kind of a picture where you have the entire cortex which is out there with very well preserved uh, you know the the cortex as well as the medullary spaces and you have a nice beautiful follicles the primary and the secondary you would think of a very clear diagnosis and that's follicular hyperplasia and again no prizes for this when we have these follicles which are very well twined amongst each other and you have this uh, fat inf infiltrations of the fat etc you know that you're dealing with something which is probably not a normal process and this is usually what is called a follicular lymphoma and life becomes very easy when you have cases like these in real life but real life is also akin with a lot of other cases something like this where you have a lymph node which is having uh, you know a picture more like a, a, a benign hyperplasia of the lymph node but at the same time you're not very sure the patient eventually you know when you try to do your immunohistochemistry at times it gives you a diagnosis of it being benign and that's what it was reported only that the patient will come back again and that's what happened in this particular case as well and at that point of time when the flow cytometry was done a rest lambda restricted population of b cells which was 10 positive was picked up from the lymph node itself clearly telling you that you're dealing with possibly a follicular lymphoma which was there you know present in one area of the lymph node so practically speaking when you look at uh, you know pictures like what you see on the top it's pretty simple for you to pick up the diagnosis but at times when you have cases which are down here diagnosis can become a major challenge and whether we like it or not the lymphoma diagnosis even till date happens to be diagnosed primarily from a morphological diagnosis so gold standard even today happens to be morphology and that's where the first step of the diagnostic starts however what's very very important is we need to remember we are living in an age of litigation and lymphoma is one area where i can tell you the litigations are plenty especially in oncology setups so in such cases we need to be very sure as to what we're dealing with and that's where the ancillary techniques come in and it's no more uh, you know what is called a luxury to actually ask for immunohistochemistry flow cytometry and molecular techniques in lymphoma diagnosis today what's very important to realize is a lot of times we would like to get a diagnosis you know quickly and we would like to say okay just give me it in two markers or three markers and i would really put it very emphatically here that sometimes even 10 or 15 or 20 markers when you put it across on the immunohistochemistry chemistry you can have a challenge to give a diagnosis as well so what does the treating physician need to know and what a diagnostic report should ideally contain should be a morphological diagnosis which is preferably from the who blood uh, blue book you have to give a grade good immunophenotype if you have flow cytometry along with your routine immunohistochemistry that would make it far better have a good genotype available if that's possible look at the proliferation of the tumor and also comment on any transformations which would perhaps be there in some cases now when you establish the diagnosis of a lymphoma the simple stuff that you need to look at is clonality and clonality establishing clonality can be relatively easier when you're looking at a b cell non hodgkins lymphoma but the same may not be true when you're looking at hodgkins lymphoma or a t cell lymphoma it is not as simple as it looks on this particular slide and at times it can be really challenging to pick up cases on the face value itself let's look at lymphoma b cell clonality what you need to evaluate is a kappa and a lambda and let me tell you it is not easy to do a kappa and lambda on a uh, on an immunohistochemical slide because immunohistochemistry will stay in the background proteins as well and at times it can be very difficult to decipher whether you having positivity or not of course when you do immunofluorescence on such cases or you do flow cytometry you are able to pick it up much much easier for example these are the slides which my colleague dr tina has shared with me some time back and what you can see here is we are discussing a, a clonal population which is this green population at the top and what you're observing the yellow one up here is very clearly polyclonal but when you look at this yellow population down here you are very clearly seeing that it is actually restricted to lambda and showing no kappa expression really clearly telling you that you're dealing with something which is a follicular center cell neoplasm 
As far as the T cell clonality is concerned, you're not that lucky to have it very easy. Though there is something available on flow cytometry, which is basis or TCR uh, variable region of TCR beta gene rearrangement. I'll not get into details of that, but again, it's only able to pick it up in about 75% of the cases. We also need to remember that we do, when we do T cell clonality, it does not necessarily need a lymphoma. It could at times be just a proliferation of a clonal cell. Now, when you come to classification of lymphomas, it's important to remember that one, morphology becomes very important in the cornerstone, and therefore it's important for all of us to know that we need to have a good morphological diagnosis available with us. Again, it's important to know that genetic alterations and clinical features all taken together become important. It's also important to know that we look at the S phase fraction. This can also be done on flow cytometry. Of course, a lot of us are aware of the fact that we can do it on the immunohistochemistry by doing KI67. The S phase fraction can be done on flow cytometry where you look at the indolent and aggressive lymphomas based on the S phase fraction itself. I'll not get into details of that. And again, when you start using FNA samples, you can pick it up on flow cytometry in a very nice manner, which can actually help you to give information. And this has been already done a lot across the globe and is almost prevalent in a routine in majority of the countries uh, in the Western side. So there are a lot of advantages with FNAC. I will not get into details of that, but the most important thing is we can actually get a WHO compatible diagnosis from FNAC and flow cytometry. So if you look at cytology and flow cytometry together, you are able to give diagnosis in almost about 94 to 95% cases. Anyway, use of heavy chains is also very important. Again, due to the paucity of time, I will not get into details of that, but just to show you these few scatter plots which are here, you are able to differentiate two distinct populations of cells which very, very nicely correlate with what is seen on morphology. And that's what you're able to see here, the germinal center cells, as well as the you know, marginal zone cells, as far as the B cells are concerned. And the same thing you are also able to pick up on flow cytometry by using CD10, as well as the BCL2, which you're able to see in these two uh, scatter plots over here. I'll not get into details for the paucity of time again, but again, clonality becomes important, which you're able to pick up very nicely. You can see that in both of these cell populations in these slides, you're able to see a polyclonal population of kappa and lambda, clearly telling you dealing with uh, something which is you know, um, a reactive process. Again, heavy chain expression is something which a lot of us read about in the books, but we don't really care about it because we must have read about IgG, IgD, IgA, and IgM, but we don't even really realize as to how it becomes important. Many a times it becomes extremely important for us to know this because this is something which gives us a possibility of picking up a clonal process. So this is important for us to know. Again, in T cells, which I already mentioned, flow cytometry happens to play a very important role and this can be picked up on lymphomas as well. S phase fraction is something which I already told you. You can see that this is a high grade lymphoma, very high S phase fraction. Whereas on this side, you have a very low S phase fraction, clearly indicating that you're dealing with a lymphoma, which is not aggressive. Hodgkin's lymphoma, on the other hand, is uh, you know, a bit more complicated vis-a-vis -vis flow cytometry. It is not easy to get your Hodgkin's cells, but you can always look at the immunohistochemistry of the Hodgkin's lymphoma. Of course, two classical and very important uh, diagnoses which need to be differentiated between each other is the nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma and classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it is, to, a, to an experienced eye, it's possible to be differentiating them pretty easily. Also, if you look at the uh, approach with respect to the immunohistochemistry, you are able to look at the large cells and basis the approach which I have delineated here, it's available in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology, you are able to differentiate them between various cell types. So the Bible that all of us would still follow and which we will follow for the years to come is the WHO Blue Book. And this is something which is important for all of us to remember. The diagnostic categories given out here are the ones which we follow. Of course, sometimes tumors don't read the books and we have tough times as well. Now coming to the uh, a ma major change in the diagnostics and that is primarily sh a huge shifting of the paradigm from where we were to where we are going. You know, we were previously looking at a diagnosis which was coming only from the biopsies and stuff like that. But now we are trying to look at a precision medicine. And in that precision medicine concept, we are actually not looking at only conventional therapies. We're looking at lots of other therapies and I was actually expecting somebody to talk about uh, the, you know, the uh, liquid biopsy. But having said that, it is important to remember that these DNA fragments, et cetera, which come out from these tumor cells are actually looked into and then you can look at the target therapies which becomes extremely important in lymphoma diagnosis today. So finally to conclude if I may say so we were here long 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 back you know only at gross pathology or autopsy pathology at that point of time but in this century now we have to combine all these modalities which includes the molecular genetics the fish the PCR and next generation sequencing now including flow cytometry 
microscopy, morphology, cytogenetics, etc., to come to a conclusive diagnosis. And importantly, these are the points which are expected to be there in a lymphoid uh, neoplasms, whether non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you are able to see all these findings which are given usually in a report, which is a comprehensive report, and this is nothing but a CAP protocol report. And similarly, when you look at the Hodgkin's one, again, the lymphoma report has to be an extensive and a combined report which should combine all these modalities to give you the best possible diagnosis for you to go ahead with treatment appropriately. So to conclude, morphology still remains the gold standard. Immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry is imperative in today's day and age, and genomics perhaps is going to be the next game changer with respect to the lymphomas per se. And we've already seen that in some of the trials which have gone across globally. And ultimately, it may permit a good molecular diagnosis with integration of therapeutics and individual tailored, tailored treatment. Thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, all the best for the further deliberations of the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Handu. And I don't think that anybody else would have been able to do an equal justice to this topic in just 10 minutes. And I think it's always a very lot of pleasure listening to you. And uh, I will request everybody else to post their questions in the chat box, uh, marking the question to everybody, everyone, and the answer should be sent to everyone so that everybody uh, can, can benefit from the answer. And with this, we'll go on to the next topic. And the next topic is if we can actually diagnose a high-grade polycular lymphoma before starting therapy, and for that, I invite upon Dr. Dinesh Bhurani, who is Director and de uh, of Department of Hemato-Oncology and Bone Marrow Transplant at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute and Research Center, New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Bhurani. Sir, so you have to unmute yourself also. Slides are visible? Uh, yes, 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 your slides are visible, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thanks for giving me opportunity. I have a 10 minutes. So it's good I have a 10 minutes, so I can, I have to prepare less. So, how do we identify a high risk uh, follicular lymphoma? It is very important at the diagnosis. Do we have the tools to uh, make it whether it is a low risk or high risk, like we do it with the AML and other conditions where we, even uh, many lymphomas? So there are various ways we can do it. Uh, so using a baseline uh, tumor burden to determine the risk, how much is a tumor burden? Uh, the indications for the treatment are usually the, the volume of the tumor. And that's how we start the treatment. So someone who has a lesser volume, uh, we keep it on the follow-up and that uh, the treat indications for the treatment has, has still have not changed. So this is the way uh, we know this disease needs to be treated and this disease needs to be followed up. And now we have a tumor burden, you know, the baseline tumor burden by metabolic tumor volume prediction by you know, PET scan. So there are many studies, probably future will be whether we can, uh, uh, not only by the examination, not only by the simple test, will be the PET scan uh, tumor volume burden. And that can help us to uh, determine whether it is a high risk or a low risk uh, uh, follicular lymphoma. Then we come to the using the clinical features to determine the risk in uh, follicular lymphoma that we will be doing and we are doing it for a long back. Uh, so using a simple uh, tools like a flippy initially was a IPI, which was a DLBCL. There was a lot of problems. So using that into the follicular lymphoma. So we had a, uh, this is from the pre uh, uh, rituxima bira. So A is called a no lash, age, LDH, hemoglobin stage and number of nodal sites. And that still is a valid uh, tool to prognosticate uh, follicular lymphoma diagnosis. Uh, there are many refinements, but nothing has changed uh, this one. Uh, so uh, further refining in uh, this uh, flippy has been validated in rituximab bira also by the multiple centers. Uh, there's a small uh, refinement uh, using a similar kind of uh, things uh, is a flippy tube, uh, age, uh, bone marrow involvement, hemoglobin, and a serum beta to microglobulin, uh, along with the size of the, uh, the node, uh, it has been validated, but it's not uh, changed the practice. So probably Flippy, uh, though the Flippy 2 has come, has not been replaced uh, by um, 
uh, by Flippy 2. There's another more simplified uh, version, it's called a Prima Flippy, uh, which is uh, using only beta 2 microglobulin and age. Uh, uh, you can use it. It's a simple tool, but uh, it's still not in use. So these are the data. If you have a flippy low, intermediate or high, that gives you a prediction for um, five years and 10 years uh, in survival. So using a simple clinical tools, which uh, before the treatment, we should uh, identify which patients requires more uh, regular follow-ups and likely to have a longer survival. Then the micro environment, whether the crosstalk between the tumor cells and the micro environment, whether there is a T cells, so the, if there are a lot of T cells in the microenvironment, uh, interaction between the T cells and the cancer cells probably has a better prognosis than the, if you have a macrophages and other factors which can determine a worse prognosis. So the crosstalk uh, using, a, there are multiple studies uh, shown that uh, whether the crosstalk between the microenvironment and the cancer cell can determine uh, the prognosis of uh, follicular lymphoma. Then uh, everywhere, uh, like uh, Anil said, uh, the, uh, the moleculars, so we have a moleculars here too, they're using mutational analysis to determine the risk. There are uh, seven um, markers, the mutational markers, EZH2, uh, ERI, DA1, D1A, and there are many uh, more. Uh, this was validated. Uh, uh, it's not only the prognostication is there, probably slightly better than Flippy or uh, with the Flippy and uh, the M7 uh, and uh, ECOG has been combined. So probably this is slightly better than Flippy because these mutation facilities are still not available. They are not in a clinical practice. This is not only the now the prognostic marker. We have a molecule, uh, 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 EGH2 mutation, the primary, uh, the, the drug is available now. And uh, this has shown overall response rates of 69 with the 12% of the patients achieving with a single molecule, which has been recently FDA approved. So it has a prognostic implication. It has a, a therapeutic implication, but uh, this uh, M7 uh, Flippy has not been validated uh, with the uh, rituximab and the chemo-free uh, 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 treatment. So it has not been uh, valid for the, all the kinds of treatments. So we need to still work on if we are working on the mutation. It requires a further uh, uh, refinement. So they had screened the 72 genes and that's how they have come up with the low risk and high risk uh, M7 flippy and intermediate flippy. So they were able to you know, demark more precisely in comparison to flippy alone. Uh, this is uh, uh, it's called uh, clinical genetic. Uh, uh, so they, they have combined uh, some factors to say early progression, whether it's not the prognosis to determine whether the people will be progressing early. So it's a progression of disease uh, uh, within a 24, uh, 24 months, whether we can know this and whether we can then if we identify them earlier, whether we can intensify the therapy to um, uh, prolong uh, their survival. So this has been uh, proposed and validated. Uh, M7 Flippy and um, this uh, clinical genetic risk model, they were able to identify. So probably the M7 Flippy and they are able to show us around 20% of the population. Uh, 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 probably, but the, the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value is not uh, specific, it's not fine tuned. So probably they're not, uh, good enough, so good enough to identify exactly you know, how you can identify. So, so these are the very uh, two groups had uh, validated. So one is a Flippy, one is a uh, M7 Flippy, and then this is a, as a uh, progression of disease 24, uh, this clinical genetic uh, factor. So there are various things have been proposed, but nothing has replaced till now a Flippy because some of the things are not available and some of them are not still uh, validated into the large uh, trials. The most common, I mean, this is what uh, Manish told me to uh, talk about the prognostic factors before uh, the treatment, but I cannot stop it uh, talking about the response to therapy because that's the most important uh, prognostic factor. So uh, uh, prognostic factor of PET scan, so someone who achieves a CR versus achieve a PR, uh, there is a difference in the outcomes. Uh, someone who has not achieved with the six cycles of chemotherapy CR has a lesser outcome than the, so the, the post uh, therapy uh, PET scan is uh, one of the uh, predictive marker. The most important one is the early relapse. Someone who relapses uh, within a 24 hours of uh, uh, treatment, 
has a very high risk of death. So the, there is a uh, significant difference between the, if you relapse within a 24 hours of first therapy, uh, which is a immunochemotherapy, uh, to date, this is the most powerful predictor of outcome uh, have been the quality of response to the initial response. So there is a clear demarcation of 90% uh, five year survival versus the 50% overall survival, depending how you respond to the first line chemotherapy, which includes uh, chemo immunotherapy. So I think this is the most uh, important predictor. Unfortunately, that you come to know after the treatment but the, this is the one of the among the all the predictors is the prognosis marker. So this shows you a uh, person has a really a bad disease if he progresses uh, within a 24 hours, uh, 24 months. Uh, then uh, using the risk of uh, histological transformation, we know there is a risk of uh, histological transmission uh, transformation is per year some risk is there. Uh, this is a proposal. We have a clone and then you have a transformation clone. So there is some clones which are smaller. And with the timeline, they grow up and uh, leads to the transformation to the uh, uh, um, to the high high risk uh, the prog uh, aggressive disease, which itself is a worse prognostic. Uh, uh, can we identify? It can be predicted at the time of di treatment. The histological transformation can be predicted or can be prevented. So this was a large uh, review article, and there was a lot of uh, argument has been given some. Theories have been given, but uh, uh, so far there's no significant factor which can identify the who is going to transform versus who is not going to transform. So uh, there are uh, some uh, factors have been associated with the, the transformation, but they're not uh, have been validated into the. So fortunately, we have a simple tune flippy, which is still uh, determines the prognosis, but we don't have a fine tuned model. Uh, markers which can identify a high risk disease at the diagnosis whether we can change the treatment at diagnosis the high risk disease should be treated this way and the low risk disease should be treated this way unfortunately the all at the diagnosis whenever there is an indication for the uh, treatment have to be treated in the same way unless there is a, some transformation so flippy is still most commonly used a prognostic index moleculars will definitely will be on the way so we are going molecular as anil said uh, it has a therapeutic implication. So probably there will be more availability once we have the therapeutic uh, molecules available. We should try to identify high risk group prior to the treatment because it's not going to change the treatment. Many times we do not bother to know which patient is likely to um, relapse earlier. I think we should try to identify at diagnose at the time of treatment. And the early relapse post treatment is a still powerful tool. So the only way you will be knowing it treat it and know whether the patient is relapsing within a 24 hours and 24 months or not. With this, I stop. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for that uh, deliberation. I have one question. Is yes. there any way that or is there any patient of follicular lymphoma where biopsy shows follicular lymphoma where you would like to still treat like RCHOP thinking that there may be some high grade lymphoma heading anywhere or is there any way one can identify such a patient uh, so that uh, you are able to give the right treatment? So someone who is 3B uh, is equivalent to the DLBCL, he should yeah. be treated with the RCHOP. Grade 1 and grade 2 is usually is a low grade, uh, has to be r bendamustin 3A is a gray area, uh, uh, still behaves as a low grade but some people prefer to treat it as a RCHOP. Uh, every time you should be suspicious of uh, transformation. So the high LDH, high SUVs, and try to get the biopsy from the, uh, the, with the if you can get a biopsy from the, the site where the high SUV is there, uh, that can identify a transformation. So try to identify a transformation at the, the time of treatment and at the each uh, relapses you should be suspicious of transformation. If there is a transformation confirmed, you should uh, try to treat it. But someone who is grade one and two, uh, uh, and so targeting the highest SUV areas is important sure. for, for a biopsy. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, you can post your questions on the chat box. And with this, uh, I'll invite upon the next speaker. And our next speaker is Dr. Isha Call, and she'll be talking on uh, mental cell lymphomas and uh, how do we risk stratify and treat them. Of course, it's a uh, mental cell lymphoma is, is is a very variable disease uh, with uh, with patients with very low grade to very high grade disease. Uh, Dr. Isha is uh, 
diplomat of uh, American Board of Internal Medicine, and she's a consultant uh, hematologist uh, at uh, JP Hospital, uh, Noida. Thank you, uh, Dr. Isha. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful program. Uh, my brief is to talk about the uh, risk stratification in newly diagnosed mantle cell lymphoma and optimal upfront treatment. So in the, in the 10 minutes that I've been allotted, that's what I'm going to try and cover. Just a second. All right. So, um, as we all know that mantle cell lymphoma comprises about 6% of all non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Uh, it is characterized by a median, median age in 60s and a striking male predominance. Uh, it has a strong tendency to present an advanced stage disease, has a lot of extra nodal involvement, especially of the GI tract. Historically, it has been associated with poor outcomes and short overall survival. But in the modern era, with treatments that have been specifically designed and directed towards mantle cell lymphoma, these outcomes have improved. Uh, so it has a very distinct immunohistochemical uh, uh, picture, in which, uh, which is characterized by CD5 positivity, CD20 positivity, cyclin D1 positivity, absence of CD23. Uh, SOX11 is often positive, not always. And uh, the 1114 translocation is found almost universally in uh, mantle cell lymphomas. So, uh, in the recent times, there have been there has been a better understanding of different subtypes within the under the umbrella of mantle cell lymphoma. And the two newer uh, thing uh, groups that have been characterized is an entity called in situ mantle cell hyperplasia. This is characterized by basically growth of cells in the mantle zone without disruption of the lymph node architecture. Uh, it, these are cyclin D1 positive cells, but this, it usually has a very low rate of progression. So it is important to define it as a separate entity. Another interesting subtype is the leukemic non-nodal mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, these cells are generally derived from the post-germinal center cell, uh, the cells that comprise this subtype and they're characterized by a lack of SOX11 expression, and they generally have lymphocytosis and splenomegaly, and lymphadenopathy is mild. It's generally not a marked um, finding in this, in this subtype. And again, it's important to identify because of its, in its indolent course. And then of course, we know about the, uh, already that we know about is the blastoid variant, which is characterized by the TP53 mutation. So when it comes to prognostication, basically broadly we can characterize the prognostication into two groups. There are clinical uh, prognostic markers and biological prognostic markers. IPI is not enough and which is why MIPI was developed. And MIPI is basically uh, in, includes clinical characteristics, age, ECOG performance status, LDH and white cell count. But it does not take into account the biology of the disease. And it, has, it is well established that in mantle cell lymphoma, the disease biology, the cellular proliferation index is a very strong uh, predictor or powerful predictor of how that particular patient is going to behave. And this has been established by uh, cDNA microarray analysis. This, of course, can't be done in clinical practice. So in clinical practice, a good surrogate marker for the proliferation index is KI67. So KI67 of less than 10% generally correlates with the uh, indolent course, good prognosis, and uh, 10 to 29% is intermediate, and more than 30% is generally aggressive behavior. So there has been an attempt made to kind of combine both these characteristics, MIPI, as well as the biological features from KI67, into a new score um, uh, risk classification, which is called as MIPI-B, B standing for biological. So that is being incorporated into the newer studies of uh, mantle cell lymphoma. Now, uh, moving over to the management part, that was basically about progn prognostication. So uh, even though we have this MIPI and MIPI-B and all of these things that we understand about the pathology of the disease, they do not necessarily dictate how we treat a particular patient. The treatment of the patient is, does have to be personalized. And in addition to the pathology, the age comorbidities also need to be taken into account. So you'll see that most of the studies of mantle cell lymphoma, basically, you know, they divide patients into young, fit, and older, unfit uh, category. 
there is a very small percentage of patients, uh, sp mostly these uh, the leukemic variant that have uh, that can probably be observed for a number of years um, because of their indolent uh, course. But most patients eventually do end up requiring uh, treatment. So in the next section, I'll talk about the management of uh, the young fit patient. So these are essentially the transplant eligible patients. Uh, the, uh, this is the Nordic mantle cell lymphoma trial. Uh, this was a phase two trial which was conducted between 2000 to 2006. Uh, but it's important because this is one trial which gives us the longest follow-up of mantle cell lymphoma treatment in the modern era. So it included young fit patients and the Nordic regimen, which was basically maxi chop alternating with high dose cytarabine. It, it had been identified that cytarabine has a role in mantle cell lymphoma as it has you know, good uh, lymphoma activity in the mantle area. And this was followed by uh, autologous stem cell transplant. So this was basically the treatment scheme and serial updates have been published and this was the most recent 15 year follow-up of this uh, study. So uh, I think there are two important take homes from these uh, results. So there are the, the good news is that if you uh, look at the overall survival, the median overall survival is about 12 years, 12 to 13 years and progression free survival is eight and a half years. So, you know, if you see a young fit patient you can you know, counsel them um, on the basis of the study to say that if they receive an aggressive induction followed by autologous transplant upfront, they do have a survival probability, you know, the median survival in the 10 to 12 year range. The sort of negative thing that you, know, you get from this long follow-up is that there is really no plateau when it comes to progression-free survival. So even after five years, six years, six years, eight years, still patients are relapsing. So with such a long follow-up, it does become pretty clear that, you know, despite all of this, even though patients have, are getting good PFS and good overall survival, they are really not getting cured because there is no real uh, plateau here. So this is another very important study from the European Mantle Cell Lymphoma Group. This is again employees, so the, the important of, importance of the study is that this is a randomized study. So there is a uh, arm of just RCHOP, no cytarabine which is compared to uh, an arm which includes RCHOP and RDHAP being given in alternate cycles. So both arms receive uh, six cycles and followed by autologous uh, transplantation. And the, uh, the transplant also, the conditioning also included cytarabine in the conditioning protocol. So, you know, this, the, the results of this study make it amply clear that in the arm that received RCHOP, uh, RDHAP uh, alternatingly, there was a very you know, distinct improvement in uh, time to treatment failure. Nine years in the RDOP, RDHAP, RCHOP arm versus 3.9 years in the RCHOP arm and a survival benefit also. So this you know, is important because in a randomized fashion, it has been demonstrated that addition of uh, cytarabine is, gives you additional advantage over and above just an anthracycline-based chemoimmunotherapy. So, uh, this study, this is a French study. Uh, I've included this because this is the best study to answer the maintenance question in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, so this uh, study basically had young fit mantle cell lymphoma patients who received four cycles of RDAP as induction followed by autologous transplantation. One arm received uh, maintenance rituximab for three years and the other arm did not receive any maintenance. And this was published in the New England Journal and very clearly you can see that there is a benefit in the maintenance arm uh, in progression-free survival as well as overall survival. So this study basically establishes the role of rituximab maintenance post-autologous transplant in the young fit patients. Now moving over to the second subgroup of patients, uh, the older unfit patients, and this is a very important subgroup because mantle cell lymphoma is basically a disease which occurs in the 60s. So, uh, you know, treatment options for this group are also very important. So, uh, here I wanted to include this study, and uh, this is basically again trying to improve upon, upon our job. And the reason this was conducted because it was seen that bortezomib had activity in the relap in against mantle cell lymphoma in the relapsed setting. So there was an attempt to try to include it into the upfront setting to see if it gives any advantage over and above just plain RCHOP. 
so this regimen called vr cap was basically developed and as you can see here this is a randomized study which is comparing our basic standard rjob to vr cap in which uh, vincristin has been replaced by uh, bortezomib and this is transplant in eligible patients so it showed a survival advantage in the vr cap arm as opposed to the rjob arm the overall survival was 90 months versus 55 months and even though the study was not uh, meant for transplant eligible uh, uh, transplant eligible patients some patients did go on to get transplant in the study also and they also did well so you can sort of extrapolate of using vr cap even in the younger fit patients all right so um, the another regimen which is commonly used in uh, indolent lymphomas throughout the world bendamustin rituximab um so that has also been tried this is the bright study and it showed the uh, activity of bendamustin rituximab in mantle cell lymphoma uh, and it was uh, there was no statistical significance though there was the overall response rate was a little bit better with bendamustin rituximab and there were different toxicity profiles so different sets of toxicities between the uh, two arms the caveat here is that this is not just mantle cell lymphoma it included all sort of low grade indolent Uh, lymphomas and uh, not just rcop but rcvp was also uh, allowed on the study so but it does establish the effectiveness uh, of bendamustine rituximab so looking at the future this is what we already know about uh, in the future of course you know ibrutinib has come up as a very effective uh, drug against mantle cell lymphoma in the relapse setting and naturally there are attempts to bring it into the upfront setting and there are several trials about you know uh, with this question but this is uh, i think the most important trial that we you know have to look out for it is the triangle trial and it basically is trying to answer three questions as you can see there are three arms the uh, the question is about inclusion of ibrutinib up front along with the arjo padha backbone and one arm does not have ibrutinib in, indu in induction and two arms do then the second question is about the uh, inclusion of autologous stem cell transplantation and as you can see one arm does not have transplant and two arms do and the third question about the duration of maintenance so uh, the, there is a uh, two year maintenance versus three year maintenance so so there are, you know it's trying to answer all these questions so i think it's an important trial a very preliminary report of safety data was presented at ash last year but we will have to look for final results to guide us about inclusion of ibrutinib and where to place autologous uh, transplant in this uh, setting in the future uh, so just to kind of conclude in terms of treatment options these are the esmo clinical practice guidelines and they basically uh, you know give you all kinds of options to you know use in different settings my take homes basically here are that in terms of prognosis mipi is important uh, but it can be supplemented and should be supplemented with an you know additional information ki 67 is very important prognostically sox 11 expression is very uh, an important strong sox 11 uh, sox 11 uh, expression is a poor marker and tp53 is uh, important so these should be you know are easily available to us and we can include them in our prognostication Uh, in the young fit uh, any cytarabine based chemo if you use any cytarabine based chemo immunotherapy i think that's fair game our job or uh, nordic regimen our job alternating with ardhap or four ardhap there is good data to support all of that uh, there is no reason not to employ upfront autologous stem cell transplant in any patient who's fit for it followed by maintenance i'm only mentioning hyper c but very briefly um, here maybe in the blastoid variant even though the md anderson group uh, advocates for hyper cvad it is not unlike the european trials where these protocols have been studied in a multi center randomized fashion hyper cvad has not panned out in in that kind of a setting it's it's too toxic when it's whenever it's been done outside of uh, um md anderson specifically for mantle cell lymphoma but maybe in a blastoid variant in a very young patient it can be considered in the elderly unfit population Uh, all regimens whether it is br or vr cap or rchop are you know fair game uh, you can decide based on your comfort and the patient's comorbidities uh, vr cap seems pretty promising and i think there's no reason not to try it 
the question of maintenance is plus minus. There is, was a small study of maintenance after BR which did not show any superiority or additional benefit of including our maintenance when BR had been used as an induction. That is why I've uh, written plus minus. But uh, after VR cap or our job, uh, you can use it um, with you know maybe some benefit in in this population. So with that, I conclude my talk and. Uh, we can take it later. later. One very quick question. Yes. Is study on lenalidomide like we have for molecular lymphoma? Plus so, yeah, yeah. So, they are, the, the, the R square is also being, you know, tested in the upfront setting. That's all, again coming from the MD Anderson group. But it's not, you know, really standard of care. It is, uh, it has been used as a chemo free option in the relapse setting. But since I was talking about just uh, upfront therapies, I, I did not include that. Any role? Uh, 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 linalidomide maintenance, like, um, like the DLBCL and in, in so mostly I the didn't come across anything specifically. So there is, you know, the ibrutinib maintenance is being studied in some trials. Um, uh, in, interferon maintenance has been studied. I have not seen linalidomide maintenance specifically in the mantle cell setting. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And with this, we'll move on to the next part of our uh, deliberations today. And that's a, a debate. And that debate is on our job. For that, I'll ask my uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Hari Menon, uh, to kindly introduce uh, both the speakers. Dr. Hari Menon is uh, uh, MPDM Medical Oncology. And he's presently Director and Senior Consultant, Hemato-Oncology and BMT uh, Expert at Site Care Cancer Hospital, Bangalore. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Uh, I'm good. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. And thank you for having me for this uh, important meeting. Uh, I've enjoyed it thoroughly so far. Uh, so, uh, so we, we, are, we almost all lymphoma meetings does have this topic about whether we can improve upon uh, our job. And uh, there have been several attempts at doing so. Uh, some moderately giving signals in terms of some improvement and also where we may uh, choose uh, to to use uh, something more than our job. Uh, but everything is sitting on the fence most of the time. But uh, so we have this uh, debate with us who are uh, going to discuss of both sides of the coin. Uh, so my, uh, my, my good friend uh, and uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Uday uh, Yanamandra, is, uh, um, who is at, uh, the consultant medical oncologist and hematologist at, uh, at RR Hospital, uh, would, uh, would be discussing for the uh, motion of, the, of that our CHOP is the standard. Uh, and, my, and Prashant uh, from Faridabad, um, uh, who is also a very um, uh, strong proponent, uh, who's, who's who's basically a hemato-oncologist with his heart in hemato-oncology, uh, would be discussing uh, against the motion. Uh, so I invite first uh, uh, Uday to start the debate. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks for those kind words and for introducing me. Uh, I hope you are able to see my slides. Yes. Yes, yes Uday. Yeah. yeah. So our job remains to be the standard of care for all days. LVCL is what I'm supposed to debate about today. So, in life, everything is about quest for change. And change is the only constant thing in life. But at the same time, I would say new doesn't mean better. So what are we debating about today is 18-year-old 18 wife who has stayed with us since 2002 till date, that is our job, versus searching for a new girlfriend whom we really don't know who the girlfriend is, so which Prashant will do uh, for the uh, evening. So the, uh, the first thing in any scientific forum would be a pyramid of evidence. And as we are aware of this pyramid of evidence, I'll be going about sequentially, starting from RCTs to meta-analysis to the clinical practice guidelines, and then proving my point that ARTROP remains to be the standard of care. So seven minutes, I'll take one minute for each of the subheadings. So the first thing is the various RCTs to compare ARTROP with other regimens. So there was a Goya trial in which Obinutsumab was compared with ARTROP and as you could see these Kaplan-Meier curves, they were not very distinct. And uh, 
the p value was not significant so there was no difference as far as the pfs and os is concerned similarly people the da pakar which is a new kid on the block and which most of us would like to give it to our patients who are not doing very well would be to compare da pakar with archop so the calgb alliance 5303 trial tried to compare both of them and as you could see that the pfs and the os was not statistically significant in both these uh, groups in this uh, particular patients of dlbcl even at 5 years the second thing that anybody would like to do is if i can't change the regimen let's add something more to it so in a indian mentality spice it up with something so people across the world try to do that so first they added ibrutinib to the archop and tried to see if it does it really benefit so in intention to treat analysis there was no difference between ibrutinib plus archop versus placebo then they said let's do a subset analysis and they looked for abc variety of the dlbcl and again they didn't find any difference between ibrutinib versus uh, placebo uh, plus archop the os was not different between both the groups people tried to add len so r square chop versus archop though here the graphs are slightly a uh, wide apart but there are things which needs to be understood first of all this is a log pfs and it's not a median pfs and second this is the probability of pfs and not the actual pfs and thirdly if you look at the confidence interval it crosses numeric 1 so 0.63 to 1.14 and the p value is not significant considering all these things the r square chop versus r chop it really didn't meet the primary outcome then people try to add bortezomib to the archop again intention to treat no difference then they look for gcb variety no difference abc variety further no difference and then they did only for those patients whom they could follow up in a unclassified group which is not intention to treat and there was no difference now after the rcts the next thing would be to look for a clinical practice guidelines and across the world the most important guidelines that we all follow is nccn so this is as latest as around 10 days back the updated ones and if you could see archop remains to be the choice across stage 1 and stage 2 both in bulky and non bulky and also in stage 3 and stage 4 archop remains to be the primary first line therapy as on date now next thing is something new which has occurred in 2015 in nccn wherein they started adding the nccn blocks so rather than just previously we have what we used to say as grade 2b grade 2c 1b 1c so now they have five categories for e s q c and a and 1 2 3 4 5 and depending upon the amount of blue color five is the best and one is the worst in any given group so this is how matlab it appears like for the various components of these blocks but to keep the thing simple the more the blue is the better is the regimen the less the blue in this blocks is not good so if you look at the evidence blocks for the first line therapy as far as stage 1 and 2 disease everything on the top remains to be archop and combination plus minus radiotherapy both in non bulky and bulky even in patients who are very frail or patient more than 80 years of age archop remains to be the choice whereas in stage 3 and 4 again based on the data archop remains to be the drug of choice or the regimen of choice now the fifth thing people argue that the cell of origin or the molecular typing might try to change the outcomes if we use anything but for archop again as we understand that it's a heterogeneous disorder with two varieties and they differ both in translocations mic translocation mic amplification dcl2 translocation and amplifications so if we look at the total number of the dlb cls gcb and abc variety 40% are gcb and 60% are abc variety and if we look at it the double helix part is a very small component of it only around 4% and double expressor another 20 to 30%. Now these are the subgroups where there is slight uh, uh, variance as far as the thought process is concerned but I will try to throw some light on this as well. In the GCP variety people try to look at DA pakar versus R chop there was no difference in OS and PFS. People try to look for R COP versus R chop again there was no difference. Whereas in the non GCP variety where people argue that something other than r chop would work so r acvbp is the name to fame therapy as far as the non gcb type is concerned because in a trial in a single trial they have shown that it had a superior efs and os but the problems are it's a highly selective group of young patients and it had increased hematological and non hematological toxicity and this results were never replicated in any other trial but for this single trial then r chop versus r square chop in the non gcb variety again in the real trial there was no difference in os and efs so 
If we look, the OS and EFS of ABC and GCP variety is not the same, that is acceptable. ABC has inferior OS irrespective of type of therapy. And depending upon various trials, Phoenix trial, Robust trial, and Remol V trial, no benefits of addition above our chop when we add anything to it in ABC versus the GCB types. And guidelines don't suggest personalizing medicine as of date. There are no guidelines, whether we look at ESMO, the Australian, the North American, or the NCCN guidelines. There's no difference. Uh, there's no suggestion to add personalization by doing molecular typing as on date. Now, in double head lymphomas, yes, definitely DFR is better than RCHOP, but double head lymphomas form a very small percentage of DLBCA. Now, there are special scenarios, again, when the people argue that elderly patients. So, I've shown some data about the CA database, smart RCHOP therapy uh, phase two study, and R mini CHOP. In all these things, it's been shown that RCHOP is equally better even in elderly patients. Elderly defined as more than 60, and very elderly, even in more than 80, R mini CHOP. Is better than any other therapies. When we look at cardiac disease, yes, there are no RCTs to give clear cut answers. Most of them are actually prospective trial data, wherein our GCVP or CEPP have been shown to be slightly better than our job. But again, now there's a study from Mayo which showed that if we look at all DLBCL patients, there are only 6% of the patients have a poor LV function. So, do we need to really think about 6% out of 100 patients that we are treating of uh, uh, DLBCL? We need to look into it. Yes, doing a 2D echo in the beginning is okay, but trying to modify every patient's therapy or look for anything other than our chop just for this 6% doesn't really matter on ground. Now, for the special categories, even if you look at in this evidence blocks, our chop does really very well. Now, people also talk of AIDS related DLBCL and they say that, that it's better to give anything but for uh, our chop, but CD4 more than 50, our chop remains to be the choice. CD4 less than 50, CHOP, avoid R. In other groups, that is high proliferation, non-GCB, DHL, DEL, or high IPA, DIFOCR is a good option. But remember that it only forms around 0 0.1 to 0.6% of all DLBCL. So my interpretation at the end of all these things would be, do you want a better therapy than R CHOP? Yes, I would definitely want it. Yes, the research is on the right track as far as the novel drug development and molecular characterization of characterizing them into ABC variety and GCB based on the cell of origin. What's the future? Yes, I agree that it's personalized therapy, but is personalized therapy to modify induction a reality as on date? No. So what is the current standard of care for almost all DLBCL remains to be our job. Now, the last thing is boss is always right. And here boss is not Dr. Prashant. Sorry, Prashant. It's not you, but it's Dr. Rahul Bhargav, who is one of the person who is among the panelists. So if boss is always right, and if in doubt, refer to rule number one. Now here I'm going to show you that an article published by both Dr. Prashant and Dr. Rahul Bhargav together, they themselves have written in this paragraph that none of these things found a survival advantage of any of these strategies when tested without regard to specific molecular alterations, except a subset analysis of Phoenix in patient aged less than 60 years. Therefore, they themselves are committed in their editorial commentary that our job remains to be the standard of care. And anything but for that, trying to do personalization may may alter the treatment landscape in the future, but not as of now. So now the whole question remains to be, does Dr. Prashant believe in preaching what he writes? So let's listen to him. And also Prashant, you need to prove that searching a new girlfriend is better than an old married wife. So with your younger age and with your hormones, I'm sure that you'll be able to do justice for searching a new girlfriend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kai. And uh, I invite now uh, Prashant to make case of against our job. Prashant, yeah. Prashant, we can't hear you. Check. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, 
Yes, audible now. Yes, we we can we can hear you. Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah. So Uday has actually tried quite hard, very very hard to comfort everybody and tell everybody that all oncologists can let improvement go to hell and they can just focus uh, giving our job to everyone. And also, I would like to tell Uday that I don't believe in rhetoric. I I would just uh, try to bring out the facts. And also, he has quite uh, tried tried quite hard to put all the dirt under the carpet. And uh, I have been given this uh, important job to bring out all the dirt out of the you know hidden areas. So we need to understand whether we are treating every patient correctly or not. Whether it is standard of care or not, that is besides the point. Are we treating every DLBCL well and in in you know in the optimal manner? That's what we are going to look at. So DLBCLs are readily curable with immunochemotherapy, but those who fail our job, they have an extremely dismal outcome. I hope Uday, as uh, so-called the boss of or whatever of uh, hematology, understands this, and uh, all the bosses also do. And those who fail our job, they have a dismal outcome, and we need to optimize frontline treatment, not salvages. and the outcome of abc and gcb you can see the difference here can you digest the fact and can you call this an soc i don't know whether what is soc we have not defined it yet but soc is something which gives the out, optimal outcome for most most patients abc subset does not get the optimal outcome with this kind of a treatment and also by the way you showed my article you missed that line where i wrote the next line that randomizing is actually it actually kills the essence of personalized med medicine so in this in this kind of a situation randomized trials would not give an answer if they are not selected there if there is a selection bias and the patients are not not well selected and not pers not personalized at randomization so these are about 30% odd patients of abc 15% unclassifiable is it a small subset this is not that 6% which you are talking the cardiac uh, issue 6% there's a lot more to it So this is the LLMPP project with Ali Zade et al. They it was an it was an important ish, uh, article in Nature, and very very you know robust uh, article. Seventeen thousand odd 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 blocks, and this uh, seems to mean uh, nothing to you. Very very difficult to digest that. This is the GAP analysis, and look at the survival also. A small data set. It is more than IP. Some something more than IPI. It you know, this is an independent uh, prognostic factor. The cell of origin. and it's important to assert in this as well so calgb 50303 uh, you have quoted is not the answer we are not there yet and for the low risk molecular types it may be so called soc but not for these difficult to treat the ones who will relapse so so soon will not respond will be refractory what are you going to do with these patients and this final analysis of 50303 was carried out after the after the initially planned was not carried out at 242 pfs event read into the article this was after 166 pf pfs events and most of these patients were generally doing well they were good risk patients there was a selection bias and there was a very low incidence of these uh, high risk types they have checked for the double expressors themselves 15.6% is not the actual reported rate it's about 35% in literature also in their own article in their own uh, you know published article they have written that they have not said that they have answered uh, the question for high risk ipi or high grade double it or de lymphomas they have not they have themselves uh, you know agreed to that the gene expression profiling also you know it was performed generally was initially performed as a gold standard was micro array many people have tried to use ihc not very optimal these are various various ihc surrogates hans choes al algorithms but it is actually a molecularly defined subtype and these mutations cd79 a b myd88 card 11 they mean a lot we are not testing these mostly and the trials are also not randomizing after testing these mutations this is the way we should be doing it as you also pointed pointed out in your last slide so just to you know settle your raging hormones uday this is the uh, you know abc type defined by these mutations and and these mutations actually do very well you know by when we when you use targeted therapies there is data to that i'll show you one case as well from my clinic you will do well uh, looking at that as well so survival look at the survival when you're using various methodologies to test uh, for you know various uh, subtypes hans algorithm the p value 0.06.12 doesn't work 
doesn't separate the Kaplan mares, no significant difference. You have to use better, better methods. There's a nano string assay, lim to cx. We are not mostly using this. And the gene expression profiling, the p-value is very significant. The Kaplan mares spread out. You know, these are the studies which you quoted. None of these studies actually would answer it because they have not well, they have not been well done. We need to do it better. You know, and we have, we need to recognize that there are pitfalls in whatever the data is right now, and we need to improve upon that. And there is a way to do that, but we need to at least agree and believe that we have to improve. If we just sit there, just you know, believing that this is the SOC, we will never try to improve. But we got to. You know, these are the randomized studies. In my paper also, I have quoted that. You know, the pitfalls of 50303. I have already told you, and told everyone. Robust did not, you know, prove a thing. But you know, it was not a personalized kind of a randomized randomized study. The the randomization was not precise, and remodel be same problems with all these studies. Uh, Phoenix did report that uh, the younger subset did benefit, and I'll show you the benefit there. Most of the stu these studies are also not powered enough. That's also something which we need to look at. They did not find uh, advantages because specific mol molecular alterations were never addressed. Uh, the subset analysis of Phoenix less than 60, it did show a OS and a PFS advantage, but I'm not saying that, that uh, IR chop or DIPOC is a standard of care, but I'm saying that IR chop is not always the standard of care. And that, that's what we are here to debate. You know, and I'm not dogmatic about it. You know, the, you know, look at the BTK pathway, inhib pathway inhibition in DLVCL. This is an important case I'll show you. I have many more cases. You're free to discuss uh, whenever, you know, you want to with me personally. You know, this is the study where, you know, some mutations actually responded well to ibrutinib. And these were some uh, MYD88 mutations. The response rate was, all the numbers are very small. So I'm not, you know, dwelling too much into this data. But I'll show you one case from my clinic. This was a DLBCL, an ABC type. Our chop into six IFRT was doing okay, but you know, post treatment was was doing fine. But he, the TFI was less than six months relapsed, and then got uh, three RIs. This was as at another center before he presented to me. Achieves achieves CR again, but awaiting uh, uh, an auto, he again relapsed. Rebiopsied ABC again, RGTP given no response. You know, and then again he was rebiopsied. He came to me. And we you know we we decided that we will do a you know molecular workup for this patient. We did one. We did foundation one heme panel, and this is what we found. We found a CD79BY196N mutation, and this is uh, where we thought we can personalize. Uh, look at him. He got R chop up front. It did not do well. But this is just one case. But let's see what happened later. So CD79B mutation was there. We 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 knew that from that Wilson and Start study that. You know, ibrutinib single agent could also work. We did that. We gave, and you know, we got a CR here. We did not use any salvage chemotherapy. So just single agent ibrutinib. He achieved a CR. He had a matching sibling. So we transplanted him, allo transplanted, and now he he is still in CR four years post allo, doing very well. And this is my article. That line you missed. That we are not randomizing properly. Please read read uh, you know, in depth. And you will find that line written there. So we need to watch out for molecular jackpots in DLBCL. DLBCL. Our randomization needs to be precise, but it's very difficult to do. It's a very heterogeneous, uh, you know, population. DLBCL is very heterogeneous disease. We need to do much better. It's very difficult to do. I agree, but there will be a point in time where we'll do it. I don't know whether that that will happen in our lifetime because DLBCL is going to be a problem, a lo long-lasting problem. It's 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 shown that it is going to be a long-lasting problem. We're not going to get answers very soon, but we need to try, make that effort. We need to have this personalized randomization done. And still, I would still say that there is no SOC for everyone. The high risk, high risk types, they need to be managed better. We need to make an effort. What is the SOC? We will know. But thank you for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Um, so, do I have a? Uh, do I call call back Uday to? I think that you are we are running short of time. So okay, okay. So, so uh, in in that case, I would not even uh, use my uh, my slides, which I had a few of them I had prepared for uh, this lecture. So I'll just go ahead um, and just give my comments. Uh, well, uh, we know that uh, sixty percent of uh, 
all DLBL, irrespective of whether uh, whether they are uh, an ABC or a GCB subtype, are likely to do well with our chop regimen. And we are not bothered about uh, these patients. And there's nothing more that we need to do about these patients. But the remaining 25, 30% odd patients uh, are the people who uh, 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 wherein, who need to be identified. And that is where uh, we need to put our efforts. And there has been a great uh, deal of uh, understanding of the biology of the disease, uh, which segregates uh, these BLBLs into high-risk group and uh, those who are not the high-risk group. So, uh, and that is why all these attempts have been made. Uh, we all know from even 25 years, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, when the CalGP studies uh, did, did, did look at the various intensification regimen, even before the era of rituximab, uh, which did not really yield um, any benefits over the then CHOP regimen, but it did give some signals because they did understand that the primary mediastinal B cell lymphomas, for example, did benefit from uh, uh, from uh, from MACOB B regimen, which is a much more intensive regimen, and there were long term survivals for those uh, those patients. So everything about doing these studies uh, for those patients who do not do well or identifying those is all about getting some signals. And I would. Uh, in some ways, I would say that even though most of these studies have been negative in terms of uh, um, uh, in terms of better outcomes when using um, RCHOP versus uh, any other regimen, there are some signals that have come in and uh, probably allowing us to improve uh, a treatment for so those subsets. So, uh, looking at, uh, I mean, uh, looking at the uh, the uh, the cell of origin. Uh, subtypes, we all have realized that the ABC uh, subtype has got some way in which we can um, actually uh, improve outcomes or at least targeting some signals. But unfortunately, uh, those do not come, uh, come into uh, um, showing a success, uh, whether it was using uh, um, bendamustine, I mean, sorry, whether it was using bortezomib or whether it was using lenalidomide or for that matter, ibrutinib. Um, or even for that matter, enzastorin uh, in these patients. So, uh, but at the same time, we do see that uh, while it's not good to look at retrospective subset analysis, as I said, there is always a signal that comes up. So let us, we have to take the, uh, uh, those signals and work upon it a little further. Uh, so if you look at the Phoenix study, uh, we know that the intent to treat analysis did not uh, uh, reaches endpoints, and there was no benefit for adding the tux, I mean, a protein to the regimen. But at the same time, we did have uh, we did have some sort of a benefit for patients uh, below the age of sixty. Uh, and when you look at, and it is not it's not a small number; it is a substantial number. There were almost four hundred odd patients, four hundred and fifty odd patients in each arm of that study. And uh, uh, while we clearly uh, show, uh, it demonstrated that it, it is not something that can be used for patients above the age of 60, simply because the uh, standard regimen of our chop also could not be completed in these patients. Uh, uh, so, so again, again, selecting out the patients who we may want to use uh, to improve. But again, one must understand that these were all based on gene expression profiling using nanostring, and it was not based on the uh, HANS algorithm, which we all use in clinical practice. Thirdly, uh, uh, whether we can uh, improve upon uh, uh, the outcomes in identifying select subgroups of patients, uh, well, then in those patients is something, whether we need to give that much of our job uh, for patients, can we come down? And that, can, that is being clearly shown in three different studies in, uh, uh, for limited stage, uh, uh, limited stage uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, wherein uh, the, the British Columbia study based on a PET scan based approach demonstrated that giving four cycles of our job um, uh, is, uh, is probably good enough for those patients who achieve a complete metabolic response of those patients. And we also know that we can do away with in radiotherapy in patients from the FLYER study, uh, which just gave four cycles plus two cycles of rituximab with equivalent results and compared it to the standard our job regimen. And we also know that certain extra 
uh, extramedullary sites, especially testicular lymphomas, uh, need, uh, I mean, benefit from high-dose methotrexate-based uh, regimen, and we need to implement those to take care of the CNS. CNS lymphomas have to be treated differently. Our CHOP is not sufficient over there. Uh, patients with adrenal uh, involvement, um, uh, extensive bone marrow involvement, uh, uh, kidney involvement, etc., do require definitely CNS profile. You need to do more than what our job. And certainly we know about the story of double hit lymphoma, though not uh, incredibly superior, but we know that our job definitely uh, will result in failure in these if implemented in these patients. And you need to look at using uh, uh, using a more intensive regimen, preferably those suggested are epoch. And also the data for HIV associated lymphoma uh, is also quite clear. There have been, uh, our job is probably not sufficient and those suggested epoch uh, has, uh, um, has uh, a benefit. But that is where you need to do personalization of your, med uh, of, of your treatment sometimes. Uh, and all these wealth of uh, studies that have come up have just give us, given us a signal uh, wherein we might be able to use. And both the lenalidomide-based regimen, the robust study was a large study. Uh, ironically, the phase two study, which came from the Mayo Clinic, uh, demonstrated a benefit. And whereas the robust study did not show a benefit, but at the same time, when you look at, uh, when you look at the uh, nitty gritties of this, if you look at the Mayo study, they used 25 milligrams of lenalidomide in those patients. Uh, the time to uh, starting treatment in these patients were uh, much uh, much quicker as against uh, it was a median time was 22 days in the phase two study whereas it was uh, uh, 33 days or 35 days if I'm not mistaken uh, in the robust study which actually uh, many studies have shown that especially in conditions like diffuse large vessel lymphoma that can that can be uh, uh, a problem uh, because there might be a selection bias in these patients. Uh, so um, things are evolving. Uh, we, it is not yet time for us to just say that uh, we can throw it out of the window, but definitely uh, our chop is very deep rooted and it is not wrong to use our chop in most of the situations, uh, but it always uh, is useful to uh, maintain a discerning mentality uh, and probably not be dogmatic about um, s some of the patients uh, that come to you in your clinic because you're looking at about 25% of those. Yeah, so I will just conclude. I'm happy to take questions. And Uday and uh, Prashant, thank you for your uh, wonderful talks uh, and addressing these issues. Yes. Sir, thank you for the Thank you for your comments. And uh, with this, uh, I think uh, we'll never have one, one very clear answer. So far, I think the standard of care, sadly, is still our job. But there's a lot of things that needs to be improved. And I think uh, Dr. Prashant has really touched upon that. And I think the other speaker also touched upon that. With this, we'll come to the last part of our uh, today's uh, deliberations. And with this, we have uh, Dr. Ganesh. Uh, Jeshwar, who is a consultant hematologist and hemato-oncologist and bone marrow transplant physician at Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. And we know that immunotherapy is almost everywhere. And so it is in lymphoma as well. And uh, he'll be dwelling on immunotherapy in lymphomas. Dr. Ganesh. Dr. Ganesh, uh, you have to unmute yourself, I think. Yeah. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I would like to... Uh, I hope I'm audible now. You are. You are audible. Yeah. My slides are visible too? Yes, very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Panish Singhal and his team for uh, you know providing me this uh, unique opportunity because the immunotherapy in lymphoma is very fascinating and it, uh, it is the beginning of an exciting era where there is a huge paradigm shift in the management of lymphoma, particularly in the relapsed refractory setting. And I am really grateful uh, to have this opportunity to, uh, you know, have uh, opportunity to re 
review the literature of uh, the uh, evolving role of immunotherapy in lymphoma. So uh, my disclaimer here is, uh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I uh, believe and I know I am uh, uh, talking in front of an august audience of uh, my eminent oncology colleagues and my stunts at cancer immunotherapy might be very minuscule compared to what they are practicing for last many years. Uh, barring Hodgkin's lymphoma with some immune checkpoint inhibitors, my experience is almost negligible. And I'm trying to understand the concept myself. So uh, I, uh, you know, it's kind of just reviewing the literature and uh, trying to put what the data uh, presents uh, as uh, the famous uh, wording by Leonardo da Vinci, realizing that everything connects to everything else is what I'm feeling now going through the vast literature of the immunotherapy, mostly in solid malignancy with checkpoint inhibitors and uh, CAR T cell therapy in lymphoma, which is unfortunately not available as of today in our country. So I will, uh, in my brief talk, I would like to touch uh, over the, the role of cancer immunity and how the cancer evades the immune responses and that's how the, the, the lies the concept of cancer progression and you know, cancer uh, immune senescence. Then the role of immunotherapy in lymphoma, which kind of tar targeted therapy. And I'll try to briefly touch upon the two important aspects of immunotherapy, CAR T cell therapy and checkpoint inhibitors with particular emphasis on lymphoma. And uh, before uh, we discuss about the immunotherapy in lymphoma, as we all know, anti-cancer immunity basically comprises of two arms, innate immune cells, which are the, the first responders to you know, immunity against any invading pathogens like bacteria, fungi, or for that matter, cancer. And the macrophages are the preliminary, the primary cells of such defense. Uh, compared to the next line in defense is adaptive immune cells, which are very targeted, precise, specific, uh, which is majorly contributed by T cells. And how T cells recognize these target cells is very important to understand the basics of immunotherapy in lymphoma. So basically, the, uh, the cytotoxic T cells, the nucleate, the, as can be seen on the cartoon in the lower side, the nucleated cells presents endogenous antigens to CD8 positive T cells through MSC class one, uh, uh, you know, uh, present, presentation by MSC class one, where, uh, which leads to their direct cytotoxicity and the, you know, killing of these infected cells. Whereas um, uh, the, with regard to helper T cells, uh, basically, the antigen presenting cells present the exogenous antigens to CD4 through uh, the presentation by class 2 MSC molecules, which directly doesn't kill the cell, but which leads to, uh, you know, release of uh, cytokines, which leads to proliferation of the uh, CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells, which eventually leads to elimination of these uh, the APC uh, infected with the microbes. So uh, the, 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 if this immune surveillance is so dominant, why do we end up with such cancers which are progressive and refractive, refractive to various chemotherapeutic agents? And by as elaborated nicely in this journal, Hematologic uh, 2018, the strategies of immune evasion, particularly in lymphoma, can be by two ways, either by hiding the, from the immune surveillance or defending the immune, immune surveillance. So the hiding is by, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the lack of antigen presentation, post-immunization addition, and the release of various cytokines, which leads to suppression of the various, uh, you know, immunogenetic mechanisms answer, uh, against these, uh, the antigen presenting cancer cells. Whereas in the defend mechanisms, uh, the cancer cells uh, upregulate various immunosuppressive molecules like uh, uh, the uh, PDL1, CCS, uh, the fast, fast ligand uh, uh, trail, which are the uh, the direct uh, tox, uh, the immune, the direct toxic molecules uh, through which the uh, the ultimate elimination of the uh, the uh, tumor cells is uh, exhibited. So uh, by the inhibition of phagocytosis and uh, by the uh, the uh, immune surveillance, uh, which is the, the T cells, which are the major contributor of immune surveillance and their senescence and their effector inhibition, uh, which is uh, uh, done by various uh, mechanisms as postulated in this cartoon. 
So as we all know, cancer cells, uh, come, these are the normal cells having the uh, uh, abnormal proliferative, proliferative and dividing capacity. So this arises through various mutations and the genetic alterations by which these cancer cells are uh, you know, recognized by the, uh, uh, the MSC molecules as uh, non-self uh, peptides. And how these cancer cells effectively evade the immune system is by various mechanisms as can be seen from the right side cartoon, either by upregulation of various inhibitory molecules like PDL1 or uh, the, uh, the uh, stimulation of uh, regulatory T cells, which are kind of tumor immunosuppressive, uh, which carries tumor immunosuppressive uh, properties and also uh, by inhibition of various uh, uh, the cells uh, uh, responsible for immune uh, destruction like macrophages and dendritic cells. So basically, uh, the reversing cancer-induced immune escape pathways can reawaken immune system to fight cancers and that is the rationale for immunotherapy, so which can be exhibited by various pathways, the monoclonal antibodies or antibody drug conjugates uh, like the the immunotherapy has started with the evolution, the discovery of the monoclonal antibodies, mostly the CD20 uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, rituximab, which has revolutionized the uh, lymphoma therapeutic landscape. Subsequently, CD30, 79, 19, which is still a lot of uh, these, uh, the, uh, the targets have been uh, exploited uh, to improvise the outcomes in lymphoma. The next comes the adaptive T cell therapy, which is mostly by the, the bioengineered T cells, which are you know, CAR, uh, the chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, uh, which can recognize the cancer cells through specific surface antigens. Uh, then the immune checkpoint blockage by various pathways, like the most uh, important of which is uh, programmed uh, death one uh, blockage by various antibodies to this PD-1 uh, molecule uh, and which has revolutionized the landscape of not only lymphoma but uh, many solid cancers across the cancer therapeutic armamentarium and cancer vaccines uh, even though in solid malignancies it has have uh, some significant pro uh, improve uh, the out uh, the, you know, uh, positive outcomes but unfortunately lymphoma cancer vaccines has not yet uh, been proven to be of uh, significant benefit. Now coming to uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, uh, my esteemed colleagues before through their presentations and their uh, you know, debate have uh, uh, enumerated this uh, important aspect, the optimal therapy and the therapy at relapsed refractory setting. So we can see about 10 to 15% of DL B-cell despite whatever uh, therapeutic advancements has been available till date are refracted to various upfront therapies and 20 to 30% do relapse with whatever therapy offered upfront, of which 50% are transplant eligible, of which almost half of them respond to salvage regimen and of these 30 to 40% undergo transplant. So eventually looking at all these parameters uh, of all the DLB cell subset, 30% of the DLB cell uh, who are either refractory or who keeps on relapsing despite whatever therapeutic uh, strategy applied, mostly the chemotherapeutic based or transplant based regimens, do they, they do have a dismal outcome. And this is the subset where these immunotherapies can be of a huge benefit in terms of improving their outcome as has been pro proven over the last uh, uh, four years. So the, the first, uh, the immunotherapeutic approach is chimeric antigen receptor, basically the chimera, as we all know from the transplant, the, you know, the Chimeric antigen receptor T cell is basically a T cell which has two parts, uh, uh, you know, a mix of T as well as B cell. So the monoclonal antibody, the variable region of uh, uh, the light and heavy chain from the monoclonal antibody of the immunoglobulin uh, uh, combined with the, uh, the C, uh, CD3 zeta of the T cell receptor molecule, these two combined together form the chimeric antigen receptor. And there are various ways to, uh, you know, increase their efficacy by various stimulatory molecules as well as inhibiting the inhibitory co-stimulatory receptors. The most important of which, as uh, from this cartoon, is 41BB and CD28 and OX40, which is being routinely practiced 
uh, in the CAR T therapeutic, uh, uh, you know, CAR T uh, construct. Whereas the inhibitory molecules, inhibitory core uh, stimulatory receptors, the various antibodies against this has also been incorporated in the newer CAR designs uh, to improvise their efficacy. Most notably, one is PD1. So I will, uh, you know, uh, try to uh, elaborate through various uh, studies in my next presentation. And as we know, the chimeric antigen receptor T cell has uh, these three uh, uh, important uh, uh, aspects: the extracellular domain, as I discussed earlier, which constitutes a variable heavy and light chain, which is uh, linked by a linker, which is then tethered to the transmember membrane domain. Uh, uh, which basically gives the stability and the specific uh, the the antigen specificity to this uh, the antigen recognition domain, and which is again linked to the uh, intracellular uh, signal trans uh, location uh, transduction domain, which uh, basically constitutes of three uh, ITAM molecules. Uh, so basically. The item is uh, uh, the immunoglobulin uh, 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 transverse uh, trans receptor. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, so basically this is a new concept to me. I'm, I'm trying to learn. So this is how it works. And uh, uh, normally the the CAR T cells work differently compared to the normal uh, T cells. Uh, uh, in a way that the CAR T cells doesn't require MSC uh, presentation, uh, uh, it can get activated through uh, the uh, the interaction with tumor antigen, which is leading to uh, interaction uh, the by the uh, with tumor antigen by the antigen recognition domain, which leads to subsequent downstream uh, signal transduction, leading to activation of various intracellular uh, cytokine pathways, leading to uh, uh, these uh, you know the activation of the the T cell leading to eventually leading to destruction of the tumor cells. So uh, CAR T therapy is uh, has been into uh, the literature for last three decades. The first uh, CAR T uh, uh, evidence against the cancer came in uh, 1990s uh, by Dr. Zelig Eshar in uh, uh, from Israel, published in 1989. So now we have uh, various uh, advanced mints in the CAR-T design, the various uh, generation of CAR-T CAR constructs, which have advantages based on their previous, previous uh, failure features. So we have about five generation of CAR-T cells. So basically which have uh, each, the first generation CAR-T was basically uh, uh, a single, uh, 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 which has a single CD3 zeta intracellular domain but it lacked uh, significant cytotoxicity and proliferation and which failed in clinical trials, which led to evolution of second generation CAR, uh, which has uh, enhanced uh, proliferation and cytotoxicity of T cell by incorpor incorporation of the co-stimulatory domain, which can be either CD28, 41BB or CD137. Then came the, uh, as of now, we, we have only uh, second generation CAR T constructs in the clinical practice. Then came the third generation CAR, which has both, uh, you know, the two co-stimulatory domains to improve the efficacy and the uh, expansion proliferation in the clinical practice. Then uh, the fourth generation CAR actually has a, uh, uh, has a, includes a protein like interleukin-2, which is constitutively or inducibly expressed upon core activation. So basically this fourth generation CAR is also called as TRAP, the T cell redirected for universal cytokine mediated healing. Basically the advantage of this fourth generation CAR is activation of this CAR's promotes production and secretion of desired cytokines to promote tumor killing through various synergistic mechanisms involved in CAR T function like exocytosis, uh, the uh, various death lingards like FAS and TRED. The last one into the clinical research is a fourth, fifth generation CAR, which has a basically a truncated uh, cytoplasmic IL-2 receptor, beta, uh, uh, which is uh, with a binding site for transcription factor STAT3 or JAK, which actually, uh, uh, which has an antigen, uh, in which case the antigenic specific activation simultaneously triggers TCR, uh, the T cell uh, receptor, as well as post-stimulatory and cytokine uh, 
a signaling uh, uh, together which leads to synergistic uh, activation of all the three steps in PARP cell activation leading to more profound uh, effector functions of these chimeric antigen receptor T cells against uh, the tumor killing. Apart from that, there are a lot of newer CAR T constructs in preclinical as well as animal models, uh, uh, which I, I will briefly touch base in my uh, next set of slides. So basically, the CAR T cell therapy, uh, how it is practiced in clinic, uh, uh, the patients. Uh, uh, who have this kind of refractory relapsed uh, lymphomas, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells are collected, uh, of T cells are segregated, uh, which in clinic are uh, activated through various uh, cytokines. Then they are, this CAR construct, the chimeric antigen receptor is transduced into these T cells through various viral vectors. Then this subsequent T cell subset is uh, uh, made to proliferate and expand in the clinics. Uh, in the meanwhile, the patient receives lymphodepleting chemotherapy, uh, mostly the most common, uh, commonly used lymphodepleting chemotherapy is fludarabine cyclophosphamide. And uh, after a gap of two to four weeks, the same CAR T uh, product is transfused to the uh, patient. Uh, so the, as of now, the summary of these kind of CAR T uh, uh, therapies in uh, relapsed refractory lymphoma, notably uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, the transform lymphoma in primary mediastinum B cell lymphoma relapsed refractory setting, the overall response rate has been 60 to 80%, and of its durable uh, remission, complete remission rates are 30 to 40%. And mind you, these are the most refractory relapse set of patients where uh, most of the therapies have failed, and these are kind of, uh, uh, you know, amenable for palliative approach. Uh, so basically, these are the a complex process where is we you know which involves a lot of steps like the indication uh, you know the selection selection of the patients for appropriate indications and while the car trees constructs are uh, you know designed and uh, uh, manufactured uh, patient undergoes bridging chemotherapy lymphodepleting chemotherapy and subsequently a lot of toxicities and because as i mentioned earlier in this relapsed refractory setting the long-term durable remissions are 30 to 40 percent. A lot of newer, uh, you know, questions coming out of how to, what is the role of transplant uh, in those to, you know, improve the efficacy and durability of these CAR T cell based remissions further, and various toxicities, which we will briefly touch base uh, upon later. So basically, there are two FDA-approved CAR T cell uh, products in the. Uh, for uh, you know commercial use, the TSA cell, which was first approved by FDA in 2017, basically it in, involves a co-stimulatory molecule of 41 BB and a lentiviral vector. Uh, and uh, uh, here, because it involves 41 BB, it has a uh, the home stimulation is by memory uh, memory T cells, and it has a persistence be, uh, of many years. Whereas the uh, the axis cell, which is a Novartis product. Uh, retroviral vector CD28 co-stimulatory molecules. The, the idea of the CD28 co-stimulatory molecule is that it has a, a very fast uh, XYO and inVivo expansion and a very robust afferent response. But because uh, uh, it, it doesn't last long, uh, so the persistence is only for two to three months. But despite that, uh, their uh, response, uh, the durable responses are uh, as good as with those 41 bb uh, co-stimulatory molecules like TSA cell by Kite and Gilead Pharma. So you can see the Juliet uh, trial uh, utilizing TSA cell CAR T product. You can see the best overall response 52%, durable uh, uh, CR about 30%, and medium PFS not rich uh, compared to what uh, published by the, the Novartis product Zuma. Best overall response is 83%, durable CR 37%, and medium PFS of 5.9 months. Again, another third product, Lysocell, uh, uh, which again yeah, uses the co-stimulatory molecule of 41BB. And this is a unique product because uh, the previous two products, TSA cell and Axis cell, has used unselected T cells. Uh, this product has used CD4 and CD8 proportions in equal uh, amounts, uh, one is to one. And it also uh, uh, has a memory subset uh, and uh, the, the transient trial, the preliminary results are quite promising. 
but it is yet to be approved by the various regulatory authorities across the globe. And you can see, uh, 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 based on the both approved products, Axicel as well as uh, the uh, the TISA cell, you can see the durable responses are quite significant in this relapsed refractory subset of patients. Now, coming to the toxicities, most important of all, you know, the major toxicities are uh, cytokine release as well as neurological toxicities because of the various cytokines released, which uh, crosses the blood brain barrier. This uh, CRS, the median onset of two to four days, neurological toxicity, median onset of four to seven days. This is very important because as of uh, now, we as uh, oncologists and hemato-oncologists across the country are, are tuned to manage our relapsed refractory cases uh, with various chemotherapeutic options. These kind of immunotherapies are yet to arrive in India and we should be uh, familiar with these kind of toxicities which requires a multi a uh, specialty approach to handle these uh, cases. And uh, 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 even though the toxicities are quite significant, but uh, the, the grade three, grade four toxicities are less than 10%, uh, 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 but still we need to acquaint ourselves with this kind of toxicity. And, you know, with the kind of, these kind of immunotherapeutic uh, options in this kind of uh, 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 relaxed refractory lymphomas, you can see the trends in atologous transplant across US. Uh, there has been marginal decline in atologous transplants in GLBCL in particular. You can see from 1400 in 2015 and after the, the, uh, the origin of the CAR T-cell therapy being approved by FDA, the, the lymphoma cases undergoing atologous transplant has dropped more than 50%. Uh, in 2018, about only 600 cases underwent atologous transplant compared to 1400 in 2015. And you can see on the down curve, the rising, uh, you know, the expanding uh, utilization of CAR T cell therapy and various other immunotherapy uh, options, you can see from 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020, the, the blue bars are DLB cell. The numbers of cases uh, undergoing this kind of immunotherapy uh, therapeutics are exponentially increasing. So apart from that, a lot of newer, uh, you know, designs, uh, bi-specific, bi uh, allogenic CAR tree designs with uh, inbuilt uh, PD-1 inhibitor, uh, PD-L1 antibody uh, 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 pre-therapy along with this, uh, the lymphodepleting chemotherapy can improve the outcome of this kind of CAR T ther therapies. Apart from that, the NK CARs, uh, you know, the major limitation of T cell, uh, the CAR T design is because of the T cell exhaustion, senescence, and the lack of adequate T cell dose in patients who have undergone heavy chemotherapies uh, in the, uh, the prior treatment lines. So NKCAR is a promising option in them, which can be a allogenic source either from the NK cell line, pot blood or IPSC. And these are kind of off the shelf product, which can be readily available to anyone who needs these products. And it has, uh, you know, preclinical as well as the phase one clinical models has shown a promising efficacy. And the next generation CAR T cells, like dual CAR T cells, which requires two CAR uh, to be simultaneously activated uh, to you know, uh, optimally lead to the, uh, the cancer eradication, the split CAR, wherein one CAR uh, is without post-stimulatory molecule, the other CAR constructs is again installed on the same T cell. Uh, the activation of both leads, both together leads to T cell activation. Then drug inducible CAR, uh, various uh, uh, FITC CAR, and uh, uh, inducible CAR. Uh, these are the newer uh, uh, CAR T designs, which are yet to come to the clinical practice. They are still in the preclinical models, preclinical or animal models, and their efficacy is not yet proven in the clinics. Now, switching gears further, the next important immunotherapeutic option in lymphoma. Uh, particularly in Hodgkin's lymphoma is PD-1, PD-L1 axis in cancer. As we all know, the interaction of T cell with tumor cell uh, antigen through MSC class 1 uh, 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 co-presentation leads to destruction of these tumor cell. Uh, but at the same time, uh, after interaction with the tumor cell, uh, there is upregulation of PD-1 and the release of interferon gamma leads to uh, overexpression of PD-L1 on the tumor cells, which, uh, you know, uh, reciprocally inhibits the, uh, the T cell mediated cytotoxicity against the tumor cells. And that's how the tumor cells uh, evade the immune system. So basically, the treatment, in, uh, treatment that they are taking advantage of this immune escape to fight against the cancer uh, uh, that immunotherapy 
has completely revolutionized the uh, the uh, the uh, therapeutic armamentarium in most in the solid malignancies but also in hodgkin's lymphoma kind of uh, lymphomas where pdl1 is uh, over expressed uh, uh, by more than 98% of the cancer cell in hodgkin's lymphoma that is rs cells and then uh, this was quite uh, a breakthrough in 2013 you can see a science magazine uh, you know the cover page uh, having this uh, uh, cancer immunotherapy making it smart in the uh, cancer therapeutic armamentarium and this is again quite uh, widely elaborated in this uh, cartoon the checkpoint inhibition in cancer immunotherapy normally as i mentioned earlier the t cell receptor through msc1 after encountering the cancer antigens lead to the cancer uh, cancer cell destruction i am going to finish in next uh, yeah, two minutes yeah yeah so these antibodies uh, against these uh, uh, the inhibitory uh uh, uh pd1 uh, pd1 anti pd1 uh, l1 uh, uh, axis uh, can have uh, can reset the uh, the immune destruction of the cancer cells and this was uh, quite uh, appreciated across the world uh, by you know this nobel the highest felicitation nobel uh, to these uh, two scientists for immuno oncology in 2018 and we can see in hodgkin's lymphoma despite the remarkable progress with various therapeutic options afferent uh, the about uh, 10 to 15% in early stage and 20 to 15 to 30% in the late advanced stage do continue to relapse at a median uh, uh, of 3 years so the the various therapeutic options uh, uh, like the salvage chemotherapy followed by autologous transplant is the standard of care despite that about uh, 40% uh, keep on relapsing even after transplant or even after various novel therapeutic options so here the pdl1 blockage uh, has a very huge promise uh, uh, in this kind of uh, relapse refractory or post transplant relapse or uh, the various uh, chemotherapy uh, agents refractory hodgkin's lymphoma and this was the first paper which came in uh, negm by uh, stephen ansel in 2013 uh, published in negm you can see new uh, map in relapsed hodgkin's lymphoma Uh, the response rate 80% uh, post transplant relapse as well as post brentuximab uh, relapse the the uh, of 70% has cr and at 6 months 86% uh, maintained their remission again this is a keynote trial various uh, uh, you know chemo immunotherapeutic option immunotherapeutic options like pembrolizumab pdl1 inhibitor uh, uh, compared with brentuximab which has fared Uh, quite superiorly to these transplant ineligible relapse refractory patients uh, not only that uh, looking at the promising results of this immunotherapeutic options the these immunotherapeutic options are also going uh, uh, moving into front line uh, uh, looking at their uh, better tolerability and safety profile pembrolizumab with uh, avd protocol uh, uh, you know skipping bleomycin which has a huge toxicity you can see the pre phase with the pembrolizumab leads to more than 90% reduction in metabolically active tumor volume pfs 100% complete molecular remo- remission 100% uh, in this uh, 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 stage 3 to 4 uh, stage 2 to 4 uh, front line pembrolizumab so mind you here the relapse rates are 15 to 30% and the, the durable response here was up to uh, the durability of the response was beyond 2 uh, to 3 years again post transplant relapse is a real challenge and uh, the the post transplant uh, uh, as well as pre transplant with this immunotherapies is still feasible as by this international cohort uh, various immunotherapeutic options incorporating both nivolumab and pembrolizumab to your overall survival 80% to your overall progression free survival 65% still uh, quite a promising uh, uh, results uh, in this very Uh, futile uh, or uh, refractory kind of patients now the future of immunotherapy uh, as published in asco 2018 uh, this combining different immunotherapeutic options can offer further uh, improvised outcomes so to conclude cancer immune surveillance and immune escape in cancer has been well understood over last three decades and this they, because of this uh, better understanding of the the immune escape in uh, lymphoma in particular Uh, and there uh, the various therapeutic uh, strategies to target this uh, the immunotherapeutics has led to a paradigm shift in oncology uh, with establishment of various immunotherapeutic agents 
uh, immunotherapy of lymphoma is actually exploitation of immune reset mostly by T cells to establish immune eradication by of this lymphoma by these immunoactive cells. CAR T, uh, CAR -T cell therapy uh, for B cell lymphomas is very effective, but it is complex, expensive, and can be associated with serious side effects. We need to acquaint ourselves uh, before this kind of advanced immunotherapeutic options become available uh, in near future in our country. PDL1 blockage therapy works well in Hodgkin's lymphoma and in some non Hodgkin's lymphoma like uh, mediastinal B cell lymphoma. Compared to CAR T cell therapy, it is very easy to administer and relatively safe. Immunotherapy is revolutionizing the lymphoma management and future looks quite promising. Uh, with that, uh, this kind of change to have a better chance of long-term outcome in this case of uh, hopeless patients is the future. And uh, I again thank all the, uh, the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity for, for a topic where I had uh, uh, in personal no experience, but uh, it has given me an opportunity to review the literature and learn myself. Thank you so much. And uh, I will like to end by, uh, you know, urging to keep uh, all of you uh, wishing and uh, praying uh, the safety and well-being of all of you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Ganesh, uh, for giving that very super extensive uh, review on immunotherapy in lymphomas. And with that, uh, I thank all the faculty members and attendees to join in uh, today and, uh, uh, and uh, having a feast, of, feast on lymphoma updates. And with that, uh, I thank uh, our scientific partners and also uh, CIPLA, NATCO, and Alcom and INTAS who have helped us in organizing this uh, particular meeting. And also Tarun and Horizon and its entire team who very relentlessly has worked uh, to get all the faculty members on board and uh, making it a super success. Uh, with that, thank you everyone and I wish you a good night. So, Dr. Manish, thank you so very much for your kind words. So with your permission, can we close the meeting now? Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.